Ezekiel passage this morning, or else Mary will think she just read it because we were amused by her having to read something so strange and weird. Uh, I just uh, offered that passage up this morning because it gives you some sense of how strange Scripture can be if you don't understand the context in which it is written. That story of the great throne and the wheels within the wheels moving in every direction and the seraphim with the hands beneath their wings might sound completely odd unless you are familiar with Babylonian art of that age. And then you will see that in fact the Babylonians honored their kings very greatly and so they would push them around on great wheeled thrones with multiple sets of wheels that could move within every different direction. And the symbol of the four-winged seraphim uh, are also familiar, simply signs of the power of their godly king. And what Ezekiel was doing was one-upping the Babylonians with images even more powerful and wonderful than they can imagine. But if you weren't aware of that, you would think that those passages were just strange and weird and could never be understood by anyone. And with all of Scripture, once you understand the context, and once you understand the real human struggles of the people who wrote it and the people for whom they were writing, it starts to make a whole lot more sense. I'm going to speak to you today a little more about the resurrection of Jesus Christ and what it means for people in the year 2009 and how we can understand it in a way that not only makes sense, but that invites us into a deep relationship with God through Jesus Christ and has the power to change the way that we think and believe and live our lives on a daily basis. After the death of Christ, there was a great difficulty amongst the Christian people or those who were wanting to convert to the Christian faith. The difficulty was that they had never seen Jesus and they had never seen any evidence of his resurrection. Whatever this thing called resurrection was, it was something confined to a specialized group of people in a very small area. So those early authors had to start writing about the resurrection and explaining to the people exactly what it meant and how the resurrection could change our lives. Around 60 years after the death of Christ, in the Gospel of John, John tells the story to his audience of the disciples gathered in a room closed off from the world because they are afraid of the church officials. And into the gloom and the fear and despair of that room, Jesus Christ appears to them. And whereas they are frightened and lonely and filled with conflict and sadness, Christ comes to them and breathes on them. When he breathes on them, he says, receive the Holy Spirit. And if you receive the Holy Spirit, you will have power to go out into the world and to forgive. And it's so powerful that Christ in this appearance has one main concern, and that is that his disciples be fountains of forgiveness to the world. Remember that wherever you go, if the Spirit is in you, you will give forgiveness. And of course, the second part of that story involves the one disciple who was not present for that appearance, Thomas. And when they tell Thomas, he says, I don't believe you. I would have to see and touch him for myself to know that he is raised up. And then, of course, very obligingly in this story, Jesus appears again when Thomas is there, allows Thomas to see and touch him, but then chastises Thomas. 
And he says, Thomas, your desire to see me and touch me was wrong. And the real blessed people are those who believe in me but have never seen me. And so the story of Thomas becomes the answer to all of those people who say, we've never seen Jesus. Thomas stands in for all of them. And in fact, Thomas stands in for all of us who really wish we had a little more evidence of the presence of Christ. And Christ says, stop looking for evidence. Instead, remember who and what I am. And what Christ wants us to remember is this, that his life says to us, God is love. That his death says to us, we are all broken and sinful creatures who need forgiveness. And that means that we live our lives with grace and mercy towards others whom we perceive to be sinners. And his resurrection means that every human life is ultimately precious and eternally significant. And we need to live with those beliefs, and those beliefs will change us, and those are the beliefs that bring us into relationship with God.